The Spirit in the cross, the work of the Holy Spirit in the process of salvation. This is lesson number eight in that series. And this one is entitled The Gift of the Holy Spirit. And as we normally do, we start with some review. We've said so far that new messages from God to man usually are accompanied by charismatic gifts or miracles, miracles or signals that say, hey, you know, God is saying to us, hey, something new is coming or someone new uh, is here. We said that uh, the apostles had a new message, that the kingdom was finally here, that Jesus was the way into the kingdom, that Jesus was God. This was a new message, this was a revelation. And uh, this new message, of course, was accompanied by miracles, signs. This new message, which was the gospel, was accompanied, as I said, by miracles or a signal, which the Holy Spirit empowered them to do. You know, we're asking, how does the Holy Spirit work? Well, the Holy Spirit empowered the apostles and others uh, to um, give them a signal uh, for which uh, they would um, use to preach the gospel. Also said that the Holy Spirit, and I've used this term, raised up the cross, raise up the cross of Christ. This is the end goal, to raise up the cross, to make the cross visible, understandable to the world, he did this through the empowered witness of the apostles. That was the means. The means is the empowered witness. The end is to raise up the cross, to make it visible. Number five, the work of the Holy Spirit in the process of salvation is to, as I said, raise up the cross before the ancient world. And he did this through the witness of the Jews. He maintained the Jewish nation for centuries through wars, through you know, all kinds of problems, uh, but maintained them because they were the light unto the Gentiles and ultimately they represented the cross of Christ. Uh, he raised up the cross before the disciples and the apostles and he did this by resurrecting Jesus from the dead. And he raised up the cross before the Jewish nation. And he did this by empowering the apostles to make their witness. So today we're going to complete our study with an examination of how the Holy Spirit raises up the cross of Christ before the Gentile nations. And this begins with the Roman soldier we call Cornelius. And we'll get to him in a moment. Before we talk about Cornelius, the first Gentile convert, we need to understand some terms used concerning the Holy Spirit because that's where the confusion comes in when you talk about the Holy Spirit. Read a familiar passage. Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we're familiar with that passage. Let's read another passage. He uses the same kind of term, but for something different. First Corinthians 12, it says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. But to each one is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good, it gets confusing. The gift of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit, the Spirit falling on you. I mean, uh, you know, which is which? For, one, uh, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, and to another gifts of healing uh, by the one Spirit. There's more. And to another, the effecting of miracles, and to another, prophecy, and to another, distinguishing of spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as He wills. Okay, so we have to make the distinction between the gift of the Holy Spirit on one hand, Acts 2.38, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter, 12 here that I've just read. So the gift of the Holy Spirit or the gifts of the Holy Spirit as Paul describes them in 1 Corinthians 12 are the empowerments 
the ability to perform miracles, to prophecy in order to confirm the message or the witness from God. The gifts are the signals that point to a revelation or a new message or a new meaning from God. Paul was writing to the Corinthians in part because they were misusing these gifts that they had received. All right. Now the passage in Acts 2.38 is part of the gospel message. It doesn't promise gifts of empowerment, but rather it promises the Holy Spirit himself as a gift to all who respond to the gospel. Remember he says, repent and be baptized and you shall uh, for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. So there's a different, the gifts uh, given by the Holy Spirit to empower people, that's one thing. And then the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit himself given to individuals that does not involve empowerments, miraculous empowerments, okay? So in Acts 2.38, it's, it's part of the gospel message. The offer of the Holy Spirit as a gift is the fulfillment of the promise in the Old Testament that when the Messiah would come, God himself would always be with all of his people, not just with the prophets, not just with the kings, not just for a time, like it was in the Old Testament, the spirit would fall on them or would be poured out on somebody to do a particular thing, to be empowered. The promise was the spirit will be with everyone, all the believers, and he will be with them all the time. You know, if you were, if you were in Pentecost Sunday and you were listening to Peter's speech, the thing that would really you know, impact you as you were listening to him speak was not, you'll receive, you know, repent and be baptized, you'll receive the forgiveness of sins. That wouldn't be the sentence that would really impact you because, you know, John the Baptist was saying the same thing. No, no, the thing that would impact you was, now is the time that the spirit is going to be with everyone. That was the you know, the wow moment, that was the thing that was impressing them. That was the promise. You, you, don't, you don't read the Old Testament where you hear the promise of forgiveness of sins. You hear the promise that the spirit will be with the people. That's the promise and that's what uh, Peter was preaching about. And Peter actually quotes Joel the prophet to help you know, to help the audience that he has make the connection. In Acts 2.17 it says, and it shall be in the last days, now he's quoting Joel, and this is Joel. God says in the last days, what, what's going to happen? Your sins are going to be forgiven? Well, yes, but that's not what the prophet is saying. He says, in the last days, I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit and they shall, uh, they shall prophesy. So the gift of the Holy Spirit is the manner that God would now be with his people. In the Old Testament, God's constant presence with the Jewish people was realized by his presence in the temple. You know, where is God? And you're in, you're in the Old Testament. Where is God? Well, he's in the temple. How do you know? Smoke it was filled with smoke. He's there, he's with us. We have the symbols, you know, we have the ark. We have the, you know, that's where he is. What's the promise for the future? The promise for the future is he's not going to be in the temple. He's going to be in you. And Peter is standing up and he says, you know that promise that God would be with you? That's now. That's happening now. And then he says, repent and be baptized. You know, and so on and so on and so forth. So now the Holy Spirit, God, would be with each believer in a dynamic way. 
indwelling and remain for one's life. And in so doing, watch now, abolish the need for the Jewish temple worship in order to draw near to God. I'm sure they didn't think all of that through on Pentecost Sunday, but that's exactly what was going to happen. We don't need that anymore. We don't need that temple anymore. I mean, in saying that, you don't need the temple, you don't need the sacrificial system, you don't need the priestly system, you don't need the, you know, the descendants of Aaron. That, that's finished, it's gone, because all of that was to do what? To enable the people to draw near to God. Well, sort of, kind of near to God, about as close as you could get was to go to the temple and bring your sacrifice and then hand it over to the priest and, and so and so. You had a mediator between you and God, no more. It was quite a, quite a day. So this was the substance of the gift of the Holy Spirit. God through the Holy Spirit being intimately connected to each person for their edification and comfort. Not God restricted and closed off and unapproachable except through ritual and rules. So the substance of the Old Testament promise foretold by the prophets was that reconciliation and peace and harmony once enjoyed between God and man would be restored once and for all when the Messiah would come. Because that was the kickoff. Once the Messiah comes, then this is going to happen. The idea of the Sabbath rest was that man should stop striving after his business and activities and make every effort to get back into harmony with God and his creation. When, do, when does he do that? On the Sabbath day, that was the Sabbath. It was sacred. It was a day carved out of the week so you could stop your worldly things and you know, get, closer, get closer to God. The promise behind this idea was that one day there would be a Sabbath without end. And so the fulfillment of this came with the offer of forgiveness that brought reconciliation between man and God and the gift of the Holy Spirit which enables an ongoing Sabbath for each believer. Anybody who says, you don't believe in the Sabbath day? You, know, you ought to go to services on the Sabbath day? No, I don't believe in that. Why? Because I am in a perpetual Sabbath day. Well, why? Because the Holy Spirit dwells in me. I don't need to carve out a day to draw closer to God. God is inside of me every day, all the time. Now, there are a lot of disagreements about how exactly the Holy Spirit interacts with us. Some people understand that the Holy Spirit is with us through the intellectual imprint of the concepts in the Bible that we take in through read, reading and study. There are many in, in, in the Church of Christ even that uh, believe this is how the Holy Spirit is in you. You read the Bible, and the ideas and the concepts you know, in the Bible, eventually you know, you, they, they make their way into your mind, to your conscious mind, you know, and you, you grasp them. And, and that's the way the Holy Spirit dwells in you, through the word. Okay? Others say that the Holy Spirit is inside of us as if we are a container literally filled up with the actual Holy Spirit. And then there are views, you know, kind of in between those. It's helpful if we review what and how the actual Bible says about the way that God is with each person. And notice the words that the Holy Spirit himself uses to describe this indwelling. So the Bible uses different terms to explain this phenomenon, this idea of the gift of the Holy Spirit, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, okay? Here's a couple. So Acts 38, we saw that one, the gift of the Holy Spirit. And then in Acts 5, 32, the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. How do you obey Him? You repent and you're baptized. If the Holy Spirit dwells in you, 
Romans 8, 9, and the word dwells, the Greek word to inhabit. Now, how do you interpret that in another way? 1 Corinthians 6, 19, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. I don't get the idea that my body is a temple of concepts. My body is a temple of ideas. You know, Paul would not have used the term temple if he was talking about just ideas or concepts. He says the temple, it's a habitation. It's a, it's a sacred place where the spirit dwells. Did you receive the Holy Spirit? Galatians 3 uh, verse 2. Receive the Holy Spirit. That's not the way you, you would say. If you were talking about ideas and concepts, you would, you, would, you would be saying, did you understand what was taught to you? Did you grasp the meaning of what the scripture says? You know? But you wouldn't say, you wouldn't be trying to get that idea across by simply saying, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And then another one, God is at work in you. Philippians 2.13, God is at work in you. So the question, how does the Holy Spirit indwell or inhabit or work in us? How does, how does he do that? Well, you can't physically describe this you know, metaphysical thing. In the same way, we can't fully explain how Jesus, the Son of God, indwells the human body of the earthly physical Son of Mary. How exactly does, this, does God, how exactly did He enter into the physical body that Mary carried, conceived, and you know, nine months later gave birth to? How, how does the divine, how do they do that? I don't know. And God doesn't explain it to us. How did God, you know, how, did, how did this whole world come to be? You know, a lot of people try to explain it physically or scientifically. No, I don't know. I don't know how God did that. How, how did God, when he said, let there be light and then <laughs> the sun and the moon, how, how, how did that happen? You know, the writer of Hebrews tells us, we know from faith that God created what is from what is unseen. Oh, the Bible itself tells me this over here, we're not going to explain this to you. You just accept this by faith. Oh, okay. I'll accept it by faith then. The resurrection of Jesus, oh, you just have to accept it by faith. It happened once, nobody saw it, nobody, there were no witnesses, you just have to, is that what the Bible says? No, no, the resurrection, we got plenty of witnesses for that who leave us information. You see the, you see the difference? Not everything in the Bible is explained to us. Some of it, we take it by faith because God says. Some of it, the Bible gives us information for us to, to understand. Now, another question, how is the Holy Spirit a gift? In other words, what advantages or things that come with or through the Holy Spirit that make His presence within us a gift? Okay. First, the Holy Spirit is an anointing. Anointing was a way that the Jews indicated that someone was welcome or had been separated from the people for a special task. The prophets were anointed. Kings were anointed. For Jews listening to Peter preach on Pentecost Sunday, offering the gift of the Holy Spirit meant that they, as individuals, would be anointed by God Himself and made holy like the priests were holy, like the kings were made holy, like the prophets were holy. They were going to be like that. And who? Just the men? No, women too. Just the rich? No, the rich and the poor. Yeah, just the top class, you know, the, the priests? Oh, no, 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 the rich, 
and the poor, the slave and the free, everybody, everybody would have the Holy Spirit. Everybody would have the anointing. It was not a promise of empowering to perform signs and miracles, but rather the offer of a consecrated relationship with God and the blessing that goes with that, made possible through the forgiveness of sins. The spirit will not enter in before there is purity. And so our sins are wiped away in baptism through the blood of Christ and then the spirit enters in, not before. For Jews to permanently have the Holy Spirit, that means that there would be no mediator between them, you know, the priests, the sacrificial system, no mediator to navigate in their relationship with God. This meant that they were individually considered as God's chosen ones, not just God's people, but God's sons and God's daughters equally able to interact with him on their own. We are so used to that idea. We are so used to, we're in the middle of the day, the food gets on, hurry up, we gotta, we gotta be there at two o'clock, let's go, we gotta eat, you know, put the table on the table, we got some bread, could I have some butter? You know, put some butter on the table, the whole thing, and then, and then somebody says, oh, wait, wait, let's, let's say grace. I said, everybody, everybody stops and goes, and then, Dear Lord, we do thank you. you know, in the middle of this hodgepodge on a Saturday rush, you know, we stop and we talk to Almighty God. I mean, uh, for a Jew in the first century to even think that that would be possible, speaking to God on your own? So Paul explains the nature of this gift available now to both Jews and Gentiles through Jesus Christ. He says, for you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out Abba, Father. And we know we've said before Abba means daddy, father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. So we become sons and daughters, intimate, no intermediaries. That's what the Spirit gives us, enables us to do. That's what the anointing does. Next, the seal a guarantee. The gift of the Spirit was a guarantee. We read that Paul describes the gift of the Holy Spirit, as I say in another way, in this passage, Ephesians 1. He says, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, that's the gospel, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. This is the answer to the question, you know, I'm going to heaven, but boy, this place here on earth, I'm so ready to leave it. Anybody ready to go? Have you never said that to yourself sometimes? You know what, I'm ready to go, I'm, I'm good. You know, I've, I've raised my children, they're happily married, I've got grandchildren, they're all in school. You know, everything I wanted to do, everything I wanted to see, I pretty much have seen it. My back hurts, my feet hurts, my neck hurts, you know, my eyeballs hurt, everything hurts, you know. So God, I'm good, let's go, take me. Well, this pledge here that, that Paul is talking about, this seal, this promise, is what enables you to say a thing like that. Without fear, he says. You're not, you know, imagine, you're saying to God, take me, you know, I'm, I'm good, I'm ready to go. That's confidence. That's the spirit speaking. The fact that we have a relationship with God through Christ made possible by his cross 
in the Holy Spirit who indwells us confirms that we will receive the rewards that come to those who are God's sons and daughters. We know where we're going. Sometimes we're in a hurry to get there. That's how much we know where we're going. This was a source of great encouragement. If you had obeyed the gospel through faith expressed in repentance and baptism, what happened? Your sins were forgiven. The spirit dwelled in you. You were anointed by God himself. You were sealed, meaning it's a promise. There's no doubt. God himself has just, it's, he's locked it in. You were guaranteed to receive all the rewards of heaven. It's guaranteed. But sometimes I fail. It's guaranteed. But sometimes I don't feel very faithful. It's guaranteed. But sometimes I go back and I do a sin that I'm trying to avoid and I slip back into it. It's guaranteed. What part of the word guaranteed do we not understand? Our problem is we have a low estimate of God's love. We measure it based on our love. Our love is this teeny tiny little thing. Don't ever, mar don't ever ma uh, what's the word I'm looking at, match, compare, there we go. Don't ever compare your ability to love to God's ability to love. When he says it's guaranteed, it's guaranteed. So all of these things, were made possible because God had and has the power to adopt us as his children, Galatians 4, dwell in us through the Holy Spirit, Romans 8, 11, give us his spirit, Galatians 3, 2, and work in and through us, Philippians 2, 13. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit accomplishing all these things in us. For example, I received the gift of a million dollars from my wealthy father, that gift enables me to get an education, to travel, to give to my favorite charity, to get married, to buy a home, to start a family. The gift enables me to do things. So the gift of the Holy Spirit enables me to have spiritual blessings that I would otherwise not have. And what are those? The seal, the anointing, the guarantee, and it enables me to do things I couldn't do by myself. What's that? Sanctification. In other words, grow in Christ. I can't do that on my own. Ministry. I can't do that on my own. And most of all, resurrection. My resurrection. I can't do that on my own. So, the promise of God to a fallen, separated world doomed to eventual con condemnation and death was that one day a reconciliation with him would take place. God and mankind would once again have a close relationship. This concept was expressed in different ways. In the Old Testament, you know, they would say, I will pour forth my spirit. In the New Testament, we say baptism with the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit of God being constantly with us, with his people, was the substance of the life in the age of salvation. This promise was to be accomplished by removing men's sins and condemnation, the things that kept man separated from God. These were removed by the vicarious death of Jesus on the cross. His perfect life pays the moral debt for our sin, and your sins, everybody's sins, for all time. The cross therefore was the means and the end was reconciliation with God. The gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38, was the promise fulfilled. So the new relationship between God and man in which the Spirit of God accomplishes sanctification in men is made possible, how? By the cross of Jesus. The gift is both the spirit and what he does for us. And so the work of the Holy Spirit in the process of salvation is to raise the cross, meaning to make the meaning and the person you know, understandable and to do it to different groups, to the ancient world through the Jewish nation, to the disciples and apostles through the resurrection, 
to the Jewish nation by the empowered witness of the apostles, and finally to the Gentile world through the preaching of the gospel uh, by the apostles. Okay, move quickly. The apostles and disciples, now we're going to talk about Cornelius, have been preaching the gospel to all the Jews since they believe that the Great Commission meant you know, to preach the gospel. At, at first the apostles thought preaching the gospel to all nations meant going to all nations and preaching the gospel to the Jews. You know, to the Jews in, in, in Jerusalem and to the Jews in Samaria and to the Jews in all nations, that was the Great Commission. That's what they thought. Then one day, Peter has a vision that is about to change this and revolutionize the church because for years, years, not just months, for years, they only preached to the Jews. So we read in Acts chapter 10, the vision. It says, now there was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God who had just come in and said to him, Cornelius. And fixing his gaze on him and being much alarmed, he said, what is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now dispatch some men to Joppa and send for a man named Simon, who is also called Peter. He is staying with a tanner named Simon, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who was speaking to him had left, he summoned two of his servants, a devout soldier of those who were his personal descendants, uh, attendants rather. And after he had explained everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Note that this is a signal that a new revelation is about to come. Remember I said miracles are signals. That's a signal. All right, we keep reading. On the next day, as they were on their way and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray, but he came hungry and was desiring to eat. But while they were making preparations, he fell into a trance and he saw a sky open up and an object like a great sheet coming down, lowered by four corners to the ground. And there was in it all kinds of four-footed animals and crawling creatures of the earth and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything unholy and unclean. Again, a voice came to him in second time, what God has cleansed, no longer consider unholy. This happened three times and immediately the object was taken up uh, to the sky. So Peter now has a vision, a signal another signal, explaining in symbolic language and imagery the nature of the new message to be revealed, another signal preparing and revealing the way. I won't read uh, the next part. We know that Cornelius sends men to tell Peter that their master has had a vision and instruction from an angel to send for Peter who would have a message for them. So we know about that. Let's pick up the action in verse 27. It says, as he talked with him, now Peter goes to the Cornelius's house and they're conversing. He says, as he talked with him, he entered and found many people assembled. He is the Peter. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a man who is a Jew to associate with a foreigner or to visit him. And yet God has shown me that I should not call any man unholy or unclean. By saying this, he's saying he understands the vision that he had, okay? So we keep reading and I'll stop here. So Peter from his vision and Cornelius' vision and welcomes and understands that Gentiles should also be included with Jews as candidates for the gospel of salvation. Like I said, up to this point, they hadn't been preaching to the Gentiles. In Acts 27, 28, we also read that the people with him, with Peter, who have not had the vision or know Cornelius' story, they may not be as convinced about preaching the gospel to the Gentiles as Peter is. Remember, they didn't have that vision. They didn't know about Cornelius' vision. They simply went with Peter. And so Peter wastes no time 
in preaching the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and what, has, uh, what this has accomplished, you know, the forgiveness of sins. And then the next part of Peter's sermon, we want to read right here. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who were listening to the message. All the circumcised believers who came with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they were hearing them speaking with tongues and exalting God. Here it gets confusing, because now they're, you know, the gift of the Holy Spirit, what we're, what we're talking about as indwelling, here they use this term as empowerment. It's one of the things in the Bible, many times they use the same term referring to different things. You just have to know the context. Okay, so the next part of Peter's sermon would naturally have been to invite his hearers to have faith in Jesus, to repent and be baptized as an, ex, as an expression of that faith, just like he did in Acts 2.38. But instead, God provides another signal that a new thing is being revealed. What does he do? He empowers the Gentiles to speak in tongues. What? He can't do that. Sure he can. This is not so unusual because previously the spirit had empowered Cornelius to see and hear an angel speak to him. Well, that's a miracle and he was a Gentile. Some say this was a sign that Cornelius was saved. No need for anything else, but no. All that was, was a sign that you know, something new was going to happen. So uh, we note also, uh, and this I digress a little bit here, that in Numbers chapter 22, God empowered a donkey to speak and to rebuke a misbehaving prophet. This didn't mean that the donkey was saved, did it? Well, of course not. And also Caiaphas, you know, the evil high priest, he prophesied accurately about Jesus' death in John 11. But this, however, did not signal that Caiaphas, who plotted in Jesus' execution, was forgiven for his sins. Just because God uses a Gentile or a sinner or an unbeliever you know, uh, in a miraculous way, doesn't save that person. That's my point. So the point I'm making here is that God often used pagan kings and unbelievers as part of his signals to reveal and introduce new things, new ideas, new messages. In this case, he uses the household of a good but unsaved Gentile centurion to signal an important change that had to be made in the church. In Acts 10, 44 to 46, uh, we see the spirit empowering Cornelius and his household to speak in tongues and to praise God. In this instance, the gift given was not the indwelling of the spirit. This they received later on when they were baptized in water like everybody else. No, the gift was the spiritual gift of tongues, you know, speaking other previously unknown languages. Luke uses the term for empowerment, you know, he fell on them, was poured out on them. This was not the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, a gift given to every Christian at baptism. This was empowering and uh, a, a, a miraculous ability as a signal that a, a revelation or a new information or a change was at hand. And what was the signal for? Uh, I read, I'll go over it. I'll read it again, there we go. Then Peter answered, surely no one can refuse the water for these to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did, can he? And he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay on uh, for a few days. Peter himself declares what the signal as well as his vision and Cornelius's visions point to, that the gospel was to be preached to the Gentiles as well as the Jews. As far as Cornelius was concerned, he and his household were all immersed in water in Jesus' name for the forgiveness of their sins, and then they received the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. 
I mean, he ordered them. Why do you think he says he ordered them? Because there was a little reluctance. Who was going to do the baptizing? Cornelius' people? Well, of course not. The baptizing was going to be done by Peter's people. And Peter's people are going, oh, I don't know about this. These are Gentiles. You know, oof, we got to touch these people now. You know, you got to touch them to baptize them. So Peter orders them and he tells them, surely we can't refuse. That don't, haven't you seen the sign? Do you not recognize the miracle here that's taken place? What's wrong with you people? These people are candidates for the gospel. Get, they believed. Get them into the water and baptize them. And so through an act of empowerment, uh, the Holy Spirit enables Gentiles to speak in tongues, which God uses as a signal to Peter, the Jewish Christians with him, and later on to the rest of the apostles that the Gentiles are subject to the gospel just as the Jews are. And this will set the stage for Paul's ministry to the Gentiles in the Roman world. Well, let me just finish here. One last thing. The work of the Holy Spirit is the raising of the cross of Christ. The need of it, the meaning of it, the person of it, the manner of it, the result of it, the response to it. False doctrine or mistaken doctrine is usually found in these areas of teaching. He raised the cross of Christ externally to the ancient world, through the Jews, to the apostles, through the resurrection, to the nation of Israel, through the witness of the apostles, to the Gentile world, through the preaching of the gospel. The Holy Spirit also raises the cross of Christ to individual Christians internally it's part of the indwelling ministry. How does he do this? He comforts us in John 14, 26. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring, your remembrance to all, bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. That was for the apostles, Acts 9, 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria enjoyed peace being built up and going on in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. He comforts us, he comforts us. He constantly raises up the cross before our hearts when we doubt, when we are discouraged, when we suffer attacks from the evil one. We read in 1 John 1 uh, verse seven, but if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Well, what's the Holy Spirit doing there? He's reminding us over and over and over and over again when our conscience tells us, you're a sinner, you're no good. You're never going to make it. How do you think you're going to be pleasing to God the way you are? Look, you've fallen back into your old habits again. He continues to remind us that the blood of Christ cleanses us from all sin, so long as we realize that we need Christ every single, every single day. And then one last thing, he intercedes for us. Romans 8, 27, he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the spirit is because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And so God the Father gave the Son the cross to die on for the sins and redemption of mankind. The Holy Spirit has and will maintain the reality and meaning of the cross before the world until the end of time. Philosophies come and go, nations rise and fall, religious leaders raise up millions of followers and then they fade into history. Human beings live and some attain greatness but all eventually die, however, the cross of Jesus will always be raised up by the Holy Spirit until the Lord returns. This we can count on. And if we have faith and continue in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, one day we will receive all of the benefits that have been promised to us. I'm sorry, guaranteed. That's the word of the day. Guaranteed to us forever. Okay, well, that's the series on the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much for your attention. We'll, uh, we'll see you next time.